Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth uh, webinar. And uh, as you know, we are doing this uh, IMIM webinar series. Uh, today's topic is developments in agile project management. Here you can see the agenda that we're going to cover. So um, we're going to have a brief uh, introduction to the IMIM program and to uh, Politenco di Torino, which is uh, the co-host for this webinar and is uh, as well as uh, Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, one of the consortium members uh, of this international program. Then we will um, go to our keynote uh, uh, talk uh, about agile project management. We're gonna have a session uh, for you to ask some questions, okay? Uh, to our speaker that I will introduce uh, shortly. And then of course, uh, a time to, to give a, a small conclusion about this. So uh, my name is uh, Isaac Limus. Uh, I'm the IMIM coordinator from Universidad Politeca de Madrid. Uh, so uh, please be welcome uh, from our side to, to this webinar. Um, these are uh, the, the main outcomes that uh, we are looking uh, for you to get uh, after you have attended it. So uh, we know that usually when you're a project manager, uh, you do not know the methodology or the appropriate tools that you could use, right? In order to manage effectively uh, your teams in order to provide with, uh, with the outcome of the project. So uh, our speaker today, Professor Alberto De Marco from Politenco di Torino is gonna help us to, um, to uh, or he's, he's gonna guide us through uh, all this series of different um, tools and standards that we could use in order to accomplish uh, the project objectives. So I'm very happy to uh, have him here. Uh, I will give you more information about him um, in, in, a, in a while. Uh, after, um, I mean, after having said this, uh, I just would like to, um, to give a, sh a short introduction about IMIM because uh, usually in each webinar we have uh, people uh, who are joining our uh, international community. Um, I'm happy to see some faces, some alumni, some other people from uh, that have contacted us as well uh, for this webinar and that they had some doubts. And I, I really hope that you enjoy it and please be welcome to participate, okay? But for the ones who are new, uh, the IMIM is a multi-site master program, which means that it is studied uh, each semester in a different place. Um, basically, uh, we are preparing um, the managers of the future. Um, we, we are having really, really a, a very updated um, syllabus. We, shall, we update it uh, every year. And, um, and, and I'm gonna talk about this uh, in, uh, in a couple of slides more. We have been recognized as an Erasmus Mundus program, which means that um, we have a label by the European Union uh, because we have been granted uh, support uh, at the time by the European Commission for the high education level uh, of this program. Uh, we have renewed our consortia. So actually um, um, right now we are with the first edition with this new uh, university consortium. And uh, we're starting the second edition in September. Currently we, we have opened all the, all the admission process for, for this uh, in case that you're interested. So um, students start the first semester in, in Spain. So they, they, go, they come to Universidad Politecnica de Madrid and they study things related to strategy, resources, uh, data, and a general introduction to management and, and business and organizations. Then during the second semester, they go to the UK, to our uh, partner in Edinburgh, Harold Wild University. Uh, and then they uh, keep uh, learning more about project management uh, and managing in the enterprise. The third semester, students can choose. So um, this is one of the main attractions of the program. So that now they can choose uh, in between four countries. They can continue with Harold Watt University in their campus in Dubai. Uh, if they want a specialization in logistics and supply chain management, they could also go to Politenco di Torino in Italy, uh, our co-host today, if they want to uh, specialize in, in engineering and finance. They could also um, go to China if they want to know how to do business there uh, with our co-host, uh, sorry, our um, uh, other uh, partner, Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an, uh, or they could go to Mexico to any of the three campuses of Tecnológico de Monterrey uh, in Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, if they want a specialization in data science and, and innovation. So what happens in the last semester with our students is that they have to conduct a master thesis, and this could be company-based, or this could be also university-based, 
Um, in any case, they could practically do this uh, anywhere in the world, as long as they have a tutor or a master thesis director uh, from one of our partner universities, which is uh, also one of the feedbacks that we get as most attractive for, from our program as well. So our students come from everywhere in the world. You can see it here, mainly from Europe, um, Asia, and Latin America. So it's a really, really international cohort every year. Um, and these are some of the companies that our graduates go to. So uh, we have been partnering with some of them. We're gonna give you some uh, news, but um, we're gonna start offering some scholarships from this cohort from the people joining in September, um, um, funded by, by some of these uh, companies. Uh, but well, you can, you can get an idea that um, this is a program that uh, prepares uh, our students uh, to go to the main uh, manufacturing and service firms uh, around the world. Okay, so um, I think this is just a small, a small um, introduction about the IMIM program. So um, I would like now to um, welcome uh, again and, uh, and thanks Professor Alberto Di Marco for being here. Uh, we're very happy to, um, uh, to be with you um, because, I mean, of your double role, let's say, that you have in IMIM. Um, so, um, I, am, I mean, uh, you, you are a tenure professor at Politenco di Torino, and of course, your specialization is in project management. And I understand uh, you might be also part of the faculty uh, teaching our students, uh, and, uh, but also uh, you're in charge of international relations and, uh, and, you, and you're involved, let's say, more closely to, to, the, to the academic coordination somehow with Professor Paolo Landoni from the Politengo de Torino. So I think that it's great to, uh, to have you here. Thank you very much for accepting to collaborate with us and, and for giving this keynote speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Isaac, for a warm presentation. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to just make the point. It's likely that uh, the project management competences are going to be acquired during semester one at UPM, probably more. And while uh, during the third semester, um, students maybe uh, want to come to Torino for attending their third semester. And um, so first one in second year where the major focus, as you were mentioning, is rather on the, for the IMAM, IMA, um, is more on the interconnections in between engineering disciplines and the finance disciplines. So major, uh, major uh, in that semester for students will be to attend courses given from the Department of Management or the Department of uh, Mathematical Sciences and related to financial engineering. Uh, financial tools and everything that is connected with good engineering skills applied to um, to finance. So this is the core of the um, offering that Politecnico di Torino has brought to the IMIM and hopefully those students that are attracted with connecting uh, industrial management with uh, financial management could be taking the opportunity of a third semester in Torino. And um, so, so let me, uh, as, as promised, let me just give you a few minutes introduction to Politecnico di Torino. Uh, sure. Well, Politecnico di Torino has joined the consortium quite lately last year. So it's a brand new partner in the program, um, offering one semester of studies plus uh, for those interested uh, to, to remain in Torino for one year instead of just one semester, we may also arrange for a company-based or university-based thesis. So uh, Politecnico Torino is um, second ranked technical university in Italy, seventh ranked in Europe. It's part of the cluster uh, technical universities in Europe together with UPM. UPM and, uh, and, and, and top technical universities in Europe. Um, well, um, maybe for those that don't know about Torino, we are based in where Politecnico Torino is located in Turin, Torino, which is northwest of Italy. Uh, very historic city, it was the former capital of Italy. And uh, we are very, very well located 
close to most of the European cities. It's, it's a smart location, I'd rather say. Uh, typically, our students contribute and come into Torino, international students come to Torino, are quite happy because Torino is very close to both the seaside and the mountains. So you can have over a couple of days trips. Uh, so it's just a one hour drive from the Mont Blanc, from Monte Bianco, right? Or one hour drive from the Ligurian Sea. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty good for, for weekend. But in addition to that, it's a major, it's a major industrial town. It was the former, uh, former uh, well, we, we usually call it, we were used to call it the company town for what was the Fiat car manufacturer. Now there's very little remaining about that excellent uh, uh, car manufacturing group. We still have a design center and administration center and the production of the electric 500, Fiat 500 car. Uh, which still remains in Torino, but over the last 30 years, Torino has spread in a variety of sectors and has, very, has changed a lot, has changed a lot, has become, except for this uh, virus period, except for that, has become a very vibrant city, very close to Milano, very connected to um, a lot of IT, IT industries, uh, we do host several R&D centers from a variety of industries uh, uh, and multinational companies. We have very good industrial districts and needless to say, the students coming to Torino will have, will, will have good connections to companies, enterprises, organizations. We do not have, we, it's re, kind of an easy in Torino to, to find out good connections for internships and first employments. As, uh, as I was mentioning, Torino is the Polytechnical Torino is, is, is the technical university. The building you can see in this picture is our main uh, or is, uh, historic campus, and um, which is a nice place to live. Our university accounts for 33,000 students approximately. We do have 16% of international students overall, but for the Master of Science program, we raised to approximately 28% because at the bachelor, basically we do have national students, but the majority of students are at the, at the master of science level and PhD. So 28% of international students in, in, in masters and approximately 60% uh, international students at PhD level. Um, right, what, what to say is maybe this presentation is a little bit uh, not really updated, but we're close to have 6,000 graduates per year. 3,000 at the master of science level. So the I am, I am uh, is, is, is in addition to those numbers. Um, uh, this is about the rank we have. We have very good employment rate, as I was mentioning. So we are top university in Europe for, for ranking. We were listed first for the employment indicator by uh, by the by several rank rank ranking ranking institutions so we're strong in that especially we're very connected to industry and um well we have a large variety of offering and several fields mainly in engineering architecture and design because we are a technical university is only based um we do also have a master of science program in engineering management and in industrial in a master of science program in production engineering. Uh, so the IMIM integrates, combines, supplements, and it's a good synergy with all those programs. Uh, students coming to Torino would have opportunities. Those, the IMIM students joining one semester in Torino will have all the opportunities as given for students' life. We do have a nice students teams that you may want to join for to to combine to combine learning with um, with with fun. Uh, you will reach an international community, as I mentioned, and you may have opportunities for in addition to the IMIM courses. You may have opportunities to take. Why not? One spend in one semester in Italian may give you opportunities to learn Italian. Uh, taking advantage of all the on-campus facilities, 
which are still open during the COVID period. Students can go to the labs, libraries, can ask for tutoring counseling. And we have a large variety of part-time jobs opportunities for students coming in, uh, students activities, associations, and so on, right? Um, and a strong point could be that those students coming to Torino may be supported with uh, finding out their company-based thesis during the fourth semester if they would like to remain for the full year, as I mentioned. Um, one of the reasons why we have strong connections with industry is that we have on campus, we have large facilities, office buildings and labs for those company willing to join us. So we do have, we do host on campus, on our main campus and secondary campus, uh, we do host um, the research centers of many multinational companies. Uh, and and it, it's good to have those research centers on campus because there's uh, our students can go there for their thesis. They hire our students, PhD, do research in those, re, in, in those labs. So it's very, um, uh, it, 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 it's this, this integration of uh, organizations and industry is quite, is quite interesting for everyone. And this is one of the points that uh, I have uh, focused about. All right, so, um, but oh, of course I may be free and, and open to questions uh, if you may have about Torino or campus and, and, and the experience that you may have as a student when you will come to, to see us. And of course, those um, connections, facilities, may be also be given to alumni, the IMIM -I alumni uh, that are maybe attending this uh, webinar or maybe watching this webinar uh, on a separate date. So feel free to get in touch with me if you would like to explore more about the opportunities that Polito may also be providing to alumni. All right, um, so uh, I just also would like to thank Isaac for inviting me um, as um, it's promised we're gonna give a 20 minutes, 20 minutes um, update on project management, um, which is my, my background, my main research and consulting and teaching interest. So with the purpose of letting our prospect, future students with uh, understanding potential topics that they will learn at uh, during their I am, I am experience, or to extend possible developments in the discipline of project management and especially in agile project management, how agile project management can be applied to a variety of industries. I've prepared a few slides to share with all of you uh, in case you may be interested. So, um, and I hope this gives you a basic intro overview of, uh, of those trends that we're currently living. Because you know, uh, we've been in industry as, as young professionals after your master or as graduate students or as students approaching your bachelor and reaching your bachelor before you enter your international master in industrial management, um, you've, you've been probably exposed to uh, notions in project management. Project management has become very fashionable, but there's still debate on what is really project management because there's so many, so there's variety of you know, methodologies, techniques, and tools. And sometimes project management really extends to a very large umbrella discipline. So sometimes uh, understanding uh, the, you know, um, trying to figure out what are the key points that one has to select when trying to manage effectively a project could be an important competitive advantage for a professional. Um, sooner or later, 
in whatever industry, um, one is required to manage a project, right? And um, especially if you don't have experience or for those that also are experienced, the selecting appropriately the methodology and the framework and associating appropriate project management planning and tracking tools may be really important. Um, this is why I just would like to focus on selecting right systems, right methods as a basis for effective project management. Um, I've been working with project managers that may be able, may be good, may be having experience, but do not select the right one strategy for their projects. And this may result sometimes in a failure because it could happen that um, some projects may be managed using a traditional project management methodology and they fail. Or sometimes trendy industries such as software development industries would force their project managers to implement and use more innovative project management methodologies such as the agile project management methodologies and the project fails. So um, actually there's no recipe but it's important that professionals know differences between what is a traditional or waterfall project management technique rather than an agile one for you know, the purpose of selecting appropriate standard and communicating appropriate standard and uh, putting the foundational tools so that everyone can really perform effectively in a team and delivering their projects on time, on budget, and with desired level of, of quality. So um, that is why uh, I'd like you to, I'm, I'm just asking you a, a very quick question. Sorry for that, just a little bit of interaction. Maybe you can simply write in the chat or feel free to unmute your microphone if you wish. Um, before I start with those meters, I'd like you to Tell me how many triangles can you see in this picture? How many triangles do you see in this picture? Can you count number of triangles here? It's one, two, three, four, five, many, thousands, how many? Any suggestions for me? Seven. Yeah. Anyone with ideas or suggestions on how, tri how many triangles do you count here? For sure, I can see a large black triangle, right? Uh, feel free to write a number in the chat. No, okay. I'm just trying a little bit to catch your attention, to raise your attention at the beginning of speech. And, and so, okay, four, Marina, four triangles. Why, why four? I can see more probably, right? Just four? Is there anyone that can see more triangles? Seven, Pietro, wonderful. Seven, why seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. The six apices, right? The six moles, there's three black here, the three white, and then there's one large black and one large white. So I would say eight, Yan, thank you, Yan. So it's, Yan would say it's, it's eight triangles. But you know what? The right answer is there's no triangle. I forced you to write number of triangles, but actually there's no triangles. So the answer is zero. Can I say there's zero triangles here? Um, uh, can see there's, uh, have, a, have you ever played uh, a game that was called Pac-Man? There's three Pac-Man plus there's six black segments. And those are put in a way that you can not see triangles, but actually there's no triangles. So, why am I using this picture? Well, first of all, to raise your attention, as I said, to, to just put you on board. So come on board, come in here. Don't see triangles, but well, there's triangle, but that is the second issue. When talking about project management, everyone would say, oh, I'm experienced. I know what a project manager is. I'm a good project manager. I'm an experienced project manager. So I would use my triangles to manage the project, but sometimes it's just better to go back to basics, understanding that project management is composed of segments and Pac-Man, and then building ex novo, 
those methodologies again. So I am really asking you to try to go back to basics a little bit. As, as experienced professionals or as graduate students, you may feel experienced, but for one day, for 20 minutes during this pitch, try to go back to basics, try to figure out whether you didn't have in, you know, background in project management. I'll try to drive you towards the history, a little bit of the Pac-Man and the triangles, and we'll try to build our framework so that maybe you may take advantage of this presentation and then say next time, okay, I would apply these methodologies rather than another one according to my targets. So um, let's recall and go back to basics. Everyone knows that the project, it's not a serious production, but it's a one at a time. It's a prototype, a product produced. It could be a power plant construction. It could be assembling a, an aircraft. It could be delivering a consulting project for a client that has never been done before. So it's unique. It's uh, characterized by limited resources. It's complex project. It's complex because it involves several people. There's a project management team involved. Uh, there's complexity of uh, stakeholders involved. Uh, we do have typically have several suppliers or contractors in the project and we are constrained with predetermined objectives of time, cost and quality, right? The iron triangle, that is project, a project. And a project is that definition wouldn't change. So we know a project is hard to manage and it's complex to manage. So when, when one has defined project management in the past, in the 50s, the first time project management was defined, right? In the 50s, so 70 years ago, we first heard about project management. It was defined as a project is complex, is unique, is an iron triangle of time, cost, and quality. So we need to manage that project. And the project, basically, project management is about managing that complexity or managing the life cycle of a product, right? Or, or and, and most of the times industrial engineers involved in industrial management are concerned with managing a project of product development from design to delivery. And typically we do have those couple of phases to design phase and the delivery phase. Now, uh, when it comes to a product development process, very used to think about a pipeline from the idea generation to uh, market launch, all right. And uh, usually we undergo through successive stages of um, development. And this uh, developing a new product in an in industry requires uh, scrupulous and, and, and careful project management. Um, despite application of project management, new product development processes may abort. So uh, raising from the consideration that regardless of applying project management, projects may fail their targets, um, the project management community has uh, in the past developed two possible paradigms or approaches to project management. One is the more traditional predictive process. And the other one is uh, quite, uh, quite different. On the contrary, it's a contrary and opposite approach or paradigm that has, has been evolving and developing over the last 20 years. And we call more innovative, but it's just because it's uh, younger than the traditional predictive process is what we call the adaptive process or agile project management. Now let's, let's have a look at this slide here just to understand differences between a waterfall process versus an agile process. Well, in waterfall project management methodology, the project team would predetermine the scope of work. So the, the product that's been developed should be predetermined in advance. It's very visionary. So there's the need to understand exactly what we're going to be delivering 
And based on what should be delivered, so the scope of work and the definition of all requirements that the product would need to be developed, we then can, can estimate the budget required and the duration of the project, the time it will take to deliver the predetermined scope. We call this um, project management methodology as predictive. One needs to be a predictor or a clairvoyant, right? We need to know in advance what will happen to estimate cost and time and preparing cost and schedule estimates, right? Um, basically, we could work with deterministic approaches, sometimes with some probabilistic, but quite rare. But mostly we do work with deterministic approaches. So we predetermine a budget, an amount of money which is available and the duration and we get an approval. And then we start a project with that budget approved and that duration approved. And if something goes wrong, we tend to be preparing a contingency or a budget of money that could stay apart and could be spent to recover from possible delay or adjust for problems that may occur during the project execution. So it's a budget plus a contingency management. Everything is predicted. Uh, so typically we tend to create a plan and try to stick with that plan. And if we don't go as the plan, well, we do do get really frustrated, right? Oh, we made a plan and now the plan has not been done. And we try to bring the project back to the original plan by, by, by spending more money or by doing something, adjusting performance, hiring more people, negotiating conditions with suppliers in a way that the project would, should or must be as closest as possible to the original budget and time expectations. Now, this traditional predictive process sometimes fails. And sometimes fails, especially when the level of uncertainty is very high and when it's hard to predict accurately since the beginning, the future outcomes. That is why approximately 20 years ago, a bunch of people from the software industry uh, joined together for a meeting and they say, okay, stop it. Stop it using those predictive approach. Prediction fails because no one is a predictor. We don't have crystal balls. What we can do is to just have a vision of what could happen in the future, which is necessary. You just have a long-term vision about your, your, your journey. But then you build your journey day by day, adaptively. And you would adjust your journey and the directions of your project according to what will happen. And as far as your project lives in a very uncertain environment with lots of risks that could happen, with changes that may be brought to the project by the client or the users or anyone that is involved in the project. So we don't want to plan. Actually, what we do is an adaptive approach. We would tend to go towards our vision, but no one will care if the vision will never materialize. The journey is more important than the final destination. So to do that, forget about thinking that the full scope will be delivered. What you can do is to think about how much money you do have on hand. So think about your budget, establish a total duration for your project, and please tell me when your trip should be finished. And with that money and that time, I will try to maximize the possible scope I can deliver. It could end up with a product that is incomplete, but that's the maximum value I can deliver for that amount of money and that time. So this process is called more adaptive. Let's adapt and let's make the most out of our time and budget, uh, which is very different. Well, it would be great if with that budget and that time we can accomplish all the requirements that the vision of the product initially were thinking. But no one will actually become so frustrated because a portion of the project is not uh, developed. 
So um, those two approaches ended into different philosophies and different manuals or different books. Traditionally, the Project Management Institute had released a very important book that I call, well, sometimes called the Koran or the Bible of project management. It's, it's called the PIM book. I think most of our audience today knows about it as the guide to project management body of knowledge. It's, it's a standard book. Uh, it's the book that gives you the standard for project management. So it tells you how a traditional approach should be used to manage a project, which includes the traditional waterfall process of initiating a project, planning the project, scheduling the time, then monitoring the cost and the time and the quality performance, and then closing the project, like, like, like successive stages and gates. While the agile project management, agile is about do it different, do it iteratively and, 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 and with different adaptive approach. So in a waterfall process, traditionally, this is the process that I was mentioning, uh, the PIM book would tell you, you first initiate a project, you create a, what we call a project charter. The project charter is something that gets approval from the board of directors or the client to get the money to execute a project, then you can plan, execute. And then if the project doesn't go according to plans, you can reschedule, right? Until the project is closed. This traditional process requires defining the tasks required to accomplish the project, assign responsibilities and allocate budgets. And after allocate, and this is an example of uh, what we're used to use, the work breakdown structures. Uh, most industries use this traditional approach. For example, a project to a, a research and development project is uh, decomposed into a project management work package, an analysis work package, a development work package, an application work package, and a dissemination work package, and so on and so on. And the work breakdown structure is a decomposition of the scope of work into small tasks, right? And then each task is assigned responsibilities so that there is a clear understanding of who does what, right? In a, in a, in, and everyone is responsible to executing specific tasks. We're used to call those the RACI matrices where there is a responsible person, an accountable person, a person that should be consulted, a person that should be informed for each one of the tasks that are listed in the WBSs, right? And after that, there's a time schedule, like and, and time schedule can be laid down according to what its stage and gate process. A succession of uh, activities that follow one sequence to another in a, a sequenced form of predecessors and successors. And there's milestones, which are checkpoints, right? So for example, there's a conceptual phase and there's a checkpoint and there's research phase and then there's an approval gate and then there's analysis phase and there's approval and then development of the project and the approval and launch. That's an example of how the time schedule can be prepared. And uh, everyone is, you, is very, very familiar with uh, writing down that type of time schedule using a gun chart or, or bar chart, which is something you can see here, right? Um, so many people are familiar with using uh, project planning software tools such as Microsoft Project or, or, or Project Libre or any, any, any tool that creates a schedule like a gun chart like this one. Excellent, so everyone in a team is responsible for an activity, everyone is assigned. So when I finish, there's someone else that starts executing next to task and everything relies on a work specialization. Everyone does something and if I fail, I will be cause of delay for my successor. So I must be finishing on time as to protect myself against being blaming that I was late. So I would be, don't be found guilty. I won't be charged with responsibility for a bad project and I will save myself. Right? So everyone is doing something. 
uh, a very mechanistic way of doing something. And then there's also people taking responsibility for possible risks because risks may impact on some or all of the tasks that are involved. So we can appoint a risk owner, a person that will be charged with detecting if risk happens and then taking actions if risk happens. And risks can be you know, assessed in terms of probability and impact and estimating a contingency budget to manage such risks. So technocratic project management, mechanics of project management, strict, predetermined, predictive organization and schedule. I would rather say quite an engineering approach, right? But when it comes to different sectors, different type of projects where this mechanics are, aren't that important. And when the level of risks become very huge, we must become adaptive. So uh, we must be changing a little bit that approach. And uh, it doesn't mean that project management is no longer rigorous. It doesn't mean that we don't need to deliver a product any longer. It simply states that traditional project management is important. Traditional project management tools and methodologies are important, but adjusting and adapting to change is more important than that. And to do that, there are some principles that have been developed that is try to respond to business changes becomes all important. So the notion of agility requires integrating and interacting with the clients more than debating or negotiating a contract. Learning that reprioritization is important more than scheduling. I mean, when you write in traditional project management, we were used to prepare a time schedule and to attach the time schedule to the contract with a client. And a client could blame us and say, oh, you're not respecting the schedule, so I won't pay you for your project because you're late. Here, it's a little bit different. We need to reprioritize. What's important is if we're late, it's because we need to do something earlier than that. We change the approach and we can build our product evolutively, incrementally, and iteratively. So there was a, there's a, a famous manifesto in project management that was stated that tells that processes and tools are important. So project management processes and project management tools, like Oracle Primavera Project Planner, which is a tool, is important. But the individuals working with those tools and interactions in between the individuals is more important than the tools. So many times I've visited uh, teams that prepare a schedule because it's wonderful. They have to prepare a schedule and, and, and then no one uses the schedule, right? So, uh, and, so, so why? So it's, if we use the tools, it's because there's individuals behind the tools. It's not just because there is a tool or they use the tools to assign responsibilities, but then no one acts according to those responsibilities, even though those responsibilities have been written into, into a software tool. And there's a report that tells us who should do in what. Another one point very important is that, uh, well, documentation is important, right? But a working product or something that works like delivering a good project or a good software to a client is more important than the documentation. Customers and collaborating, talking to customers and clients is more important than just negotiating the terms of contracts, getting paid and, and, and placing a change order and, and trying to you know, debating or, or activating what we call a dispute and trying to resolve a dispute. In Agile Project Management, disputes shouldn't exist, which means that responding to change becomes more important than following a plan. So basically, and I just don't want to waste too much of your time because uh, I've been given some of the most important references, so you may want to find lots of information about Agile Project Management on the web. But basically, the development of the project is to deliver the final product to the client in pieces, incrementally. It's as if 
you wouldn't buy a car, but you would buy first a minimum viable product, which is a frame with some wheels and an engine. And then you can come back next week to get the body shield. And then you can come back next week again in two weeks to get another feature. And your car is developed over and over a few months. But this means that you don't need to wait for years to get your new car. You simply can get it in a few weeks at the beginning with a minimum viable product. And then you build your value by incrementing the optionals or the features that your project should have to be completed. Now, to do that, there is no more schedule, but there's what is, we call a task board. Task boards are typically flows of activities that move from a to-do status towards a completed status. So there's no more predecessors and successors. There's a stack or backlog of tasks to be executed that flow through in progress to be verified and completed. And when it's completed, means it's done and it's delivered and accepted for quality by the client. Another key feature is that time schedule is no more in long term, but it's basically in time boxes. The time box is a short period of time, typically two weeks. At the end of each two weeks, we need to increment the product and delivering a portion of the functionalities to the final client. You, there's a lot of agile project management uh, is, is, is inherently evolving in the software development industry, in the service industry, in R&D projects, right? Where there's the need to develop a new products iteratively. And finally, before we conclude, uh, several framework systems have been created to help professionals manage appropriately a project team using agile project management frameworks. And the most famous one is what we call the Scrum methodologies. And there's the Scrum Institute that can help and assist you if you're interested in uh, raising, getting, collecting information about. The Scrum framework establishes that a project should be having a business case and a project vision. And out of that project, long-term project vision, one can create a prior, prioritized list of features or requirements for the final product. And then you start by creating the product iteratively every two weeks by starting with what is as, as top level of priority than other requirements. As several, several um, ceremonies can be established to manage a team every two weeks. And typically are what we call a sprint planning at the beginning of the sprint and a sprint retrospective at the end with some daily meetings to help adjusting the team to appropriate performance. And uh, agile project management has also developed for several techniques for prioritizing the requirements of the product to define the backlog of activities to be executed first. And several systems also have been created to monitor the performance of the job in progress to compare actual performance versus planned performance as to make sure that the team will be performing with no stress and efficiently. Several tools have been developed, not just for the traditional project management framework, but also for the agile project management framework. And this is some, some of the uh, software tools available in commerce, but it's not the full list. It's just an examples of the, uh, rather say the, the, those that are the most diffused in usage among professionals. So that's uh, everything I wanted to share with all of you. Um, and I may be open to possible questions, if any. Well, remember you can write down your question, you can unmute your microphones. 
while maybe you are thinking or typing, I do have a question. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Alberto. It has been a very nice, interesting talk. Uh, I think, I mean, I started as a project manager, my career before uh, uh, Academy. But um, so, I mean, I, um, I was applying and I learned all the traditional, uh, let's say, tool, tools. And uh, what I would like to know is that um, sometimes these new trends, they also have downsides. So I would like to know when agile project management maybe is not um, useful and uh, is it overrated or not? Or uh, excuse, excuse me, could you just repeat your questions? Yes. I was unable to listen to you very well. The, yeah, my, my, my question is, uh, could agile project management be overrated? When is it useful and when is, is it not for a project? Yeah, um, the point is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we were running short of time, so I couldn't actually add the time to go deeper into that. Uh, the point is that Agile project management was born in, in, the, in the software development and R&D sectors, right? But currently, it's largely used also in manufacturing companies and industrial organizations. And more and more industrial organizations tend to move from traditional project management to agile project management. And I would rather say that agile project management is suitable whenever the level of uncertainty goes beyond the known unknown. As far as contingency can be well estimated because risk can be predetermined, right? For the known risk based on experience, based on similar projects in the past, at that point, traditional project management is still the best system to develop your project. But as far as the level of uncertainty goes beyond something that can be foreseen, at that time, Agile Promise is the only one system that helps you deliver your projects much more efficiently than traditional project management. So many industrial organizations now are using Agile systems to shorten and cut the time to market for product development. Because this allows to be ready for market with a, a little bit more than a minimum viable product, something that can be launched that has maybe not all of the uh, could have requirements, but at least as in a very short time, the must have requirements and the should have requirements. You know, whether the product can be used by final users, can be sent out to market, and be first on the market is quite much more important than be late on the market and with, with, with a finished product as you would have intended for it. So that is very important. And this is maybe my overall answer to your question. Level of uncertainty. It's hard to determine when, but uh, when a project team is asked, would you be able to put into your risk report all of the risks in the projects. And when the answer is yes, go with traditional project management. When the answer is yes or don't know, try to figure out how to implement an agile approach. It could be providing very, very huge benefits. Okay, thank you very much for that insight. We already have two questions. I'm not sure if you're able to uh, to read them in the chat or- Yes, I am. Uh, Gyro is asking, is there an IPMA reference for Agile project management? Well, Gyro, actually not. The in, while the Project Management Institute has released a, for an Agile guide a couple of years ago, uh, no, a little bit more, I think 2018, two, three years ago, uh, I, the International Project management associations as the traditional word, the competence baseline, and they haven't released for an agile guide yet. I know there's a team by the IPMA working on the guide and they are probably going to release it soon, but there's not yet. So thank you for your question, good. Well, Pietro, Pietro Bertuzzi I think is Italian. And my question is about the hybrid approaches, which elements usually come from the traditional and which come from the agile approaches. Well, you know what? Uh, I would tend to say that the agile approach is typically an hybrid. Why? It's because the agile approach, if you look at the scrum methodology, for instance, the scrum methodology asks, forces everyone to prepare a long-term schedule first. So there's the need to prepare a long-term schedule with all the releases of the product in advance and then readjusting the scrums or the sprints in order to reach that. So we may say that it's 
kind of a little bit of a, an hybrid approach. Um, so Scrum, by definition, Agile as a sum inherent functionalities and, 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 and documentation of the traditional project management. In general, um, hybrid approaches can be very useful in the sense that one can use the Agile system to run the team efforts while using the traditional project management system to document and reporting the work done for the external stakeholders. This is something that I would largely recommend. Think about being a consulting team. Consulting team may run their delivery using Scrum, but then they report using a traditional framework. This kinds of hybrid systems are, can be very well communicated to clients that understand more the traditional system rather than the agile, but still keeping inside the team all of, all of the advantages of an agile approach to deliver the most of the value to their clients. I don't know if I were able to get your question, Pietro, and be back to uh, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Pietro. Are you an, an alumnus to the, the IMIM or prospect to student, Pietro? Uh, yes, I'm an alumnus. I was okay. part of the Indian version of the 12th edition. And uh, we are now working uh, in the industry at Bayer Pharmaceuticals and uh, working a lot with project management. Wow, good. Also good. applying now for the BMP certification. So um, it, it helped me also. Thank you for, for the session today. Thank you, Pietro. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Marina wanted to ask something. I think she had on mute her microphone or, or if somebody else has a question. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Well, Hello. Ah, hi, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Jan Rustel from, I don't remember the, the early edition of IMIM, but I think I graduated in 2012. So yeah, uh, I think IMIM 6 or something like that. Uh, and I'm currently project manager as well. Um, my question is more about the, the trends that we see that a lot of uh, companies are going towards the, the project management thing. And you were saying that everyone would be a project manager <laughs> uh, at one point in our professional life. Uh, do you think it's a new agile um, methodologies or something that's kind of try to to, to fix the, the, the problems, the issues that, uh, that have arisen from this, uh, maybe too much of project management in big companies? Well, um, Ian, uh, I'm, I'm just noting you work for Alstom, right? So, um, and then- That's the reason of it. <laughs> yes. I, have, I have experience with Alstom in, in, in their uh, Savigliano plant here close to Torino. I have experience with some of your colleagues here in Italy. So I know your processes. I know your very cumbersome project management system that you have in, in Alstom. And, and I, I do understand your, the background of your question. That's why I just was mentioning your company. Uh, your company is one of, is, is, is very robust. So it has what we call a robust, as a heavy project management system versus a light version. The heavy uh, system is, is, is much more required when you have complex organization with thousands of people involved, manufacturing facilities all around the world a product that has strict certification authorities to release permits and you can't actually deliver a product that is incomplete and that is missing some of the, for example, security or safety or functional requirements that the final product should have. So in that case, it's, uh, you are forced to work under a traditional waterfall project management framework. However, however, uh, my experience with some similar companies such as uh, car manufacturing are giving very good results in applying agile project management for the engineering processes at the engineering stages. 
So du during the product development processes in the engineering and, and design activities. So while a, a traditional waterfall system may be used for the life cycle of your project from cradle right to, to the end of the project, it could be the, 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 the agile it gives very good results when it's used just for the engineering and design. Think about the retrofitting of one of your, for example, 100 trains project. You start launching the first one, the second, the third, and you need to retrofit the first ones because changes have been brought to the fourth and the fifth. So basically, this, the, the engineering yeah. system can be, I know that. <laughs> can be uh, having agile processes that runs on delivering new, uh, instead of activating former processes of change orders and change requests, the agile process allows to developing the features of the product more consistently and, uh, and in a shorter time, a shorter time to market. So it, it speeds up the, the engineering processes, the engineering project, the design phase of your project, maybe. This is what I have yeah. seen. I think uh, in a, and on my side, I work more on the, what we call the, the system integration, so which kind of integrates trains, signaling, and all the, all the components of, uh, of the railway systems. And in, I work in Panama, and uh, what we did, is we, we kind of, we had a contract, as you say, that uh, with uh, the, the, the requirements and then the scope and the, the, <laughs> the, the budget and the time, uh, the time frame. Uh, but what we did really was to cut it in, in some, some part, let's say. And instead of putting in service all the thing after four years, we did it in, in two or three uh, steps with yeah. the client involved. With, and uh, so I was kind of a, a bit of agility in this uh, big, uh, big contract, big projects. And I good was issue. very uh, good, very good thing for motivating the team because uh, that's another benefit. I think of course it was a big thing. Say, okay, you are not pursuing an objective that is in four years time, but every year we have something to put in service to deliver to the clients and that give a very good pace to your, uh, your team as well. Uh, that's a very good point. Agile project management requires very good collaboration with client. And usually the client must be part of the team. And, uh, and not all clients are ready for that, which is one of the obstacles of implementing agile project management. Because this also requires, it's, it's both sides. On your side, it, as a contractor, it requires huge con transparency, which also involves cost of transparency, timesheet of transparency. So the pricing policy may be, may be a, a barrier to implement an agile collaboration. And uh, on the other side, the, it's, it's hard for the client because all changes will not be negotiated because changes brings extra work to the contractor and contractor charges the time span on a project. So uh, it's, it's a pretty brand new relationship that is established that is, is a paradigm shift. And it's more, it's not, the hard point is not on the tools, the hard point is the organizations, right? Exactly, in this form of collaboration with a client. So Pietro is saying, can we say, um, can we say that the Agile methodology also works well in international teams and with different locations? Um, well, that's a key point. Uh, the Agile, Agile states that co-location, uh, virtual or physical, doesn't matter, is important. So a, a project management room, a project room or a, or a or a war, a war room is important. So this means that international teams should be sharing the same virtual, uh, virtual session. And sometimes jet lags and you know different time lags do not allow to be permanently co-located virtually in the same room working together. So this is one of the barriers. This could be one of the barriers of implementing Agile internationally. Co-location, virtual co-location. So actually co-location, um, I always understood as being physically at the local, 
but to say there's also the possibility in a virtual environment with the same time zones uh, that could also be uh, a problem. Yeah, yeah. I've experimenting in a company, for example, Sky, Sky TV. Uh, they were used to be physically co-located. Now there's COVID. They've been virtually co-located. They have their Zoom session open and they work together on Zoom. It's like being co-located. It's a little bit less smart. You can't take your cup of coffee together, but you, your daily stand-up is a little bit uh, less you know, human, but still you can have your st daily stand-up in the morning all together in the Zoom room and, uh, and then working co-located virtually, virtual room. This could be a good way of solving the, uh, the time zone or, 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 or locations of the people around. Traditional approach would it uh, bring any any benefits if we have no choice? Uh, our, some of our teams are in India, but also in US, Europe, uh, I sit in Germany. So we have this problem of the time zones, and then we that's why probably we also go for the traditional approach sometimes because we can structure the steps. And that's why international teams usually use traditional approach. Everyone is given us is assigned a, a work package. After I finish, you start, and there's input and output. Uh, it's far different from being agile. Uh, it requires stages and gates of approvals. It requires that there's quality check of the work done, and when there's 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 approval gates, and there's linkages of who's predecessor and what is the task that has been succeeding, right? And uh, so we need formal schedules in this case. Uh, it's hard to manage a Kanban board, a task board with activities in ongoing flowing, because sometimes I need something from you, right? As an input to my task. If we were co-locatedly, I can solve the impediment on a real-time basis. If to, we, we are not co-located, need to wait for your input, then I write an email, you get back to me in two days because you need to get information about. So all those impediments that the Scrum Master usually facilitates or, or the project manager usually facilitates in Agile, in traditional project management is a little bit more, it's rigorous, it's sequenced. You can control, however, because you know who's missing to give information. And, and uh, I understand it's the traditional way of doing. But sometimes you cannot physically or virtually be co-located if you're working with Indian guys or the Chinese guys, for example, and you live in Chile, right? There could be 12 hours lag. Thank yeah. Thank you, Pietro. So do, do we have any more final questions before we close the sessions? Yeah, I do have one, sorry. I wanted to ask before, but I needed to uh, step out from the session. Um, so, um, is there any other trend arising in the project management um, world there that you would recommend us to read, any reading related to it or any challenging point of view on those two um, strategies for project management? Or to explore. Well, yeah. I'd say that over, over uh, I was just mentioning that one of the most trendy uh, directions is uh, implementing agile project management. And it's been debating over the last 20, 15 years. Um, following on that direction, uh, if you work in the IT sector or financial services, IT for financial services sector, for example, one, the trendiest of those directions in Agile is for example, working in what is called DevOps, development operations. Yeah. So, I, I'm a DevOps uh, okay. engineer, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> oh, that's why you're asking. Yeah. I was thinking about that. So <laughs> now it's become over the last couple of years, the DevOps philosophy has become very, very fashionable. And there's a lot of work around implementing Scrum for DevOps. So I would really suggest you go explore into that direction. If you go to the Scrum, uh, the Scrum Alliance, the okay. Scrum Alliance, they have been working on some, you know, guidelines, suggestions, tips on how to use Agile in DevOps environment. Okay. And in the micro microservices. IT infrastructures, which is another 
topic of you know decomposing mainframe infrastructures into microservices so that you can evolve and develop your infrastructures by small microservices iteratively, like applying okay. the agile notions, not just to the process of managing the project, but to the delivery process. Delivering IT infrastructures by delivering microservices to clients. Each functionality is no longer a functionality of a mainframe software, but each, each functionality is a microservice. Okay. I will read about it. Okay. And it's really interesting, that one. So that is one of the directions. Another direction, which is more behavioral in, project, in Agile project manager, is applying project management to large organizations. So going large. Because Agile project manager was born for small teams composed of, of people from four to eight. How can you implement Agile in large organizations? How can you scale up? And that's a, that's a good, there's a chat, it's a challenge, right? Scaling up agile to agile organizations. Uh, there's good readings about that on how to scale up project management. And in particular, the PMI is trying to understand and to answer this question. Okay, so if great. You go to the PMI website resources, you will find something about that also, which is something like trendy. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, because I'm working as in a startup that now it's scaling really fast and it is also a challenge right now. Yeah, because Agile could be uh, easy to implement if you have wise people or experienced people or people that you know got some courses in Scrum Master. You can run it at, at a project level, but then mm. trying to scale it up at the entire organization is not that easy. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the answer. Oh, thank you for a nice question, Marina. All right, Isaac, I think we that's all we got time, right? Because it's uh... Yes, uh, it has been really, really interesting. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Alberto. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, it has been a really, really interesting talk. And also thank you for uh, our participants uh, for being here. Uh, and also thank you, Alberto, for opening, let's say, the doors to contact you. I think you have very impressive curricula and you're also, uh, you are the coordinator of the Project Management Lab in, in Polito, right? So I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I, I am. Yeah. Uh, I haven't put here my my email, but it's Alberto. I, I can write in the chat so that everyone interested in getting in touch with me, feel free to write. Be patient and I'll be back within a couple of days. <laughs> possibly to to connect that's or that's feel free to connect uh, with me on on linkedin of course that's great uh, thank you um also what's coming uh, i mean I, we, we like all the interaction with uh, people interested in the imi program people working it's been great to see um some alumni from previous editions some of them who have been my students like like marina it's so it's so good to to hear from you and uh, and that everything is going well so um, we invite you to, to keep in touch. We're going to have uh, more topics. So at least for this semester, these are the, 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 the different webinars and the topics uh, that um, are going to be happening uh, in different Thursdays. So we, we, we are making uh, Thursday uh, the IMIM webinar day. And um, so as you can see, there are, uh, we are covering many different topics. And all our uh, partner universities are collaborating uh, for this. Uh, our idea and, and is that next semester we also are going to uh, be inviting industry and also alumni. So I want to take this opportunity because I see that we have at least uh, three alumni um, here uh, to invite you, okay? Um, we would also like to know more about your experience, uh, what you're doing in your companies. So we want to keep, let's say, the discussion uh, between the IMIM program, the community, the industry, the, the academics. Um, we want to to have this discussion going on, okay? So thank you once again for being here. Um, we're gonna send, um, of course, also the, the recording if you want, you would like to get more information. We'll also send the details uh, from Professor Alberto Di Marco and uh, see you uh, in a couple of weeks for our uh, next webinar. So have a good uh, day, evening, night, wherever you are in the world located. And thank you very much once again for being here. Thank you very much for your patience and for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.